Um, this is a series of trainings that we've done around the state. It's our second time uh, on the Flathead Reservation. Um, but it's, what we're going to be talking about today is, is uh, the rights of Indian parents and tribes under Johnson O'Malley funding, under Impact Aid, and under what used to be Title VII and is now Title VI. And uh, we have a bunch of reference materials, but we're going to have to update them all because in December of last year, in kind of a, a, a miracle happened, and Congress actually agreed on something, and they passed the Every Student Succeeds Act. And so we've, we've gone back through today, to, and we'll be, Maylin will be talking primarily about Johnson O'Malley, and I'll be talking about the changes that uh, Every Student Succeeds Act has made on impact aid and on Title VI. Um, as soon as the Every Student Succeeds Act is codified, we can update our reference materials. But until it's actually codified, until they actually take the bill and put it into the statutes, all our references that we have before are suspect. Um, so we'll, we'll be talking with you about that process later today. But we will have some reference materials, and we'll talk to you about how we're going to get those to you. And all our presentations today, uh, uh, Tribal Ed has uh, in PDF form. So you're welcome to take as many notes as you want, uh, ask any questions you want as we go along. But you will get the presentations in a PDF form. Uh, from, from Tribal Ed. And so I'll turn it over to Professor Smith and uh, she can start her presentation on Johnson O'Malley. So, so uh, I'm going to focus on Johnson O'Malley and as for those of you that work in education, you know that Johnson O'Malley funding wise is not significant when you're looking at the overall funding budget for education. But there are a lot of other really important pieces that go into Johnson O'Malley. But before I actually start with the Johnson O'Malley stuff, I want to talk about just education in Indian country in general. And keep in mind, any time you're looking at education in Indian country, you have to go back to that historical context for it. And in order to understand what's happened and how we even get to Johnson O'Malley, you look at that historical context. And for tribes, that historical context are, are going to be looking at some of the statistics that we know about education in Indian country. And the statistics are improving, but they're still not great for who graduates and what's being taught in your uh, systems. Funding dollars are always huge. In, in looking at what programs you can do. And as we know, there tends to be a decrease in funding rather than an increase from the federal government. The other important piece that we'll see through, through, uh, through the various statutes, and Johnson O'Malley in particular, is the level of tribal involvement. And that can really be significant in making changes in your educational system. So where do you, where do you start with this? Anytime I'm doing anything in Indian country, the first place I'm always going to start is with the treaty language. And most tribes that have treaties have got some educational language in their treaties. So in exchange for giving up uh, the use of huge tracts of land, education was one of the things that the tribes bargained for, that the federal government was going to provide resources and education. Johnson O'Malley funds come into play when the federal government decided that they didn't want to be responsible for the education, that they wanted to delegate that authority to the states. So prior to Johnson O'Malley funds, most Indian kids were going to be educated through your boarding schools or your tribally uh, situated BIA run educational systems. And then Johnson O'Malley funds were appropriated in order that the states could assume that federal responsibility for education. So it's moving those kids into the public education system. As Jim Taylor indicated, recently there was the new legislation, Every, Child, or Every Student Succeeds Act, and that has some implications as well. The implications that I'm going to talk about are mainly in the consultation area. So uh, title, and I'm not sure I have these titles correctly. So I think it's title six still. <laughs> um, I think I've changed these for, for the um, Every, Every Student Succeeds Act. And then um, I think it's title seven now, right, for impact aid. So those are the changes that we have under the new, uh, new federal legislation for that. So Johnson O'Malley was passed in 1934 
For those of you that know that history piece, the 1934 date may sort of trigger the Indian Reorganization Act period. It's part of that whole Indian Reorganization Act process of the federal government. And so the federal government now was going to contract with the states to provide those educational services that they had been responsible for when it came to Indian children. Uh, as, long, as, as part of that, I will also say, uh, for those of you that have ever seen a reservation map that's an allotted reservation, you'll see what are, I refer to as the gray squares. Those gray squares are the squares that the state owns for educational purposes. So that was another uh, funding source for the state to provide funds for the education of the Indian kids. Rather than having separate educational systems, the federal government decided that they would um, transfer, I guess, Indian children into the public education system. And, and that was going to be more cost effective. And again, it was another tool for assimilation in just another format. So why is Johnson O'Malley, I've told you the funding source isn't that great, why is Johnson O'Malley so important with its limited funding? The limited funding for Johnson O'Malley, Johnson O'Malley is to target those special programs, those specialty type programs for the Indian students. So that can be used for cultural events, it can be used for language uh, restoration or preservation programs, it can be used for uh, educational materials that perhaps reflect Indian viewpoints as opposed to the state of Texas viewpoints. It also, and this is the real important part for Johnson O'Malley, requires the formation of the Indian Education Committee. Indian Education Committees are significant in shaping how education is going to operate within your tribal community. So Lucinda, you said you'd been on the Indian Education Committee, so you know that actually they have a fair amount of power if they know how to use it. And that's the important piece, is figuring out how to use that power to effectuate changes, positive changes in Indian education on the reservation. It requires maximum Indian participation in the development, approval, and implementation of all programs contracted under the Act. And that maximum Indian participation is where tribal communities can effectuate a lot of change to make sure the education systems are looking at what the needs of the Indian kids are rather than what the needs of the non-Indian kids are. That approval that the Indian education committees have for programs means that if a a uh, school district wants to implement a program, that program, if it's going to be anything utilized by any of the Indian students there, has to be going through the Indian Education Committee for approval. So that is a huge power that I think a lot of Indian Education Committees probably don't utilize to the full extent. It's not required in every, in every situation with an Indian country. But if your school board is a majority non-Indian, you have to have an Indian Education Committee. So if you have a school board that's all Indian, you don't have to have one. You can, but you don't have to have one. So for example, Browning, their school board I think is virtually all Indian. They may have one non-Indian on it. They don't have to have an Indian Education Committee, but they do. So, so it's not a requirement if your school board is Indian. Otherwise, they absolutely have to have an Indian Education Committee. Again, that participation in all the programmatic matters is really important because this is how you effectuate that change to get programs in your school that actually meet the needs of Indian students. That includes planning. So it's not that they just bring you the program. If they're talking about it, you have to be involved as the Indian Education Committee in the planning process for that program. Developing it, how are you going to develop it? How do you meet the needs of your Indian students through that program? That's a piece of it too. The implementation, how is it going to be implemented? That again is another component where the Indian Education Committee gets to be involved in how it's going to be implemented. This is the big one, evaluation. 
So if there's a program that a school has, the Indian Education Committee gets to evaluate if that program is effective. And if it's not, they get to comment on it. They get to suggest changes. They get to suggest uh, ways of making it an effective program or saying, we're not going to do this program. If they change a program in addition to the approval, they also have to go through this process. And there are federal regulations that sort of dictate how that process is going to operate. Anytime you're talking about federal regulations for tribes, it comes under Title 25 of the Code of Federal Regulation. And this uh, delineates exactly what your Indian Education Committees can do. Recommending curricula, and that includes your textbooks and the materials, the teaching methods that are going to be used in the programs. So think about your curriculum in your schools. How much of that curriculum is something that the Indian Education Committees have either supported or uh, suggested, and how much of it is something that the school district is saying, this is what we're going to do. Approving the budget and the execution of that budget, the budget we're referring to is your Johnson O'Malley funds. We're going to see an impact aid that there may be some bleed over between those two, but the Johnson O'Malley monies are controlled by your Indian Education Committee. Another, uh, I think, important power that your Indian Education Committees have is establishing the criteria for employment in the program. So how many of you have uh, had either staff or, or teachers or administrators who maybe aren't as culturally sensitive as they need to be in your programs? This is a place where you can make some type of cultural awareness, cultural sensitivity, working with Indian students, a requirement for hiring. That is a way of, a, of establishing that criteria for employment. The other piece that Indian education committees can utilize is nominating a reasonable number, and this is the qualified prospective educational program staff. So if you have staff that uh, is going to be helping implement programs that are using Johnson O'Malley dollars, then you, as the Indian Education Committee, can make nominations of who they should hire for those positions. So it's a way of uh, selecting who may be interacting with the kids on the reservation. Another piece is that evaluation of the staff and their performance in those programs under Johnson O'Malley. So those are all things that are uh, required under the Johnson O'Malley uh, regulations. But think of what can happen if you actually utilize. So instead of having the curriculum that reflects the dominant society's view of that, you can have curriculum that ref reflects a tribal viewpoint. And you can have textbooks that, oh my gosh, may actually recognize that there are three sovereigns instead of the two that you see in the textbooks. Teachers can incorporate those culturally relevant materials, be culturally responsive in the classroom. And the allocation of those resources under the Johnson O'Malley funds can support the Indian education for all that we find in the, US, in the Montana Constitution as well as some tribal codes that have uh, educational provisions in them. So this is from one of my kids' textbooks. I believe it's from their fourth grade textbook. Uh, and this is what the page leading up to citizenship and government look like. And then I turn the page and what do I find? So what's missing? Yeah, tribes aren't mentioned at all. They're not included in that picture. They're not mentioned in the discussion and the written part of it. There's nothing that indicates to a student that there are actually three sovereigns that you have to look at. There's the federal, the state, and the tribal. And then you go down to that local level. So it's not there at all. Could it be there? Absolutely. Texas has a reservation. That map could reflect the reservation that's located in Texas. Going to the fourth grade, 
You have, I always love that they put this wonderful tribal beadwork on the page before it, and then you get to the next page and there's nothing that even mentions tribes. Again, it talks about the three levels of government, the federal, state, and local, but the local is not anything to do with tribal. We're talking about municipalities, cities. We're not talking about count or counties. We're not talking about your tribal governments. And we're, they're not put at the same level as or between basically federal and state because that's where they would belong. So kids in third and fourth grade are not getting that there are three sovereigns. The Indian Education Committee could change that. They could say, we want our textbooks to reflect that. You either have to supplement it or you have to use textbooks that reflect, reflect that. In evaluating, the, the Indian Education Committee can request information about the programs and the performance of those programs. You can get information as to whether these programs are being effective. You can get information as to what materials they're using. You can get information as to what kind of uh, extracurricular activities are using to supplement it. All of that's information you can get to evaluate the programs. And you can use that then to determine what you're, what's going to happen with those programs, whether there's something that needs to be changed. Request reports as an Indian Education Committee. Ask for that information. They have to give it to you. When you're looking at how, how those programs impact, determine. Are more kids staying in the classrooms? Are they being removed from the classrooms? Are they graduating? Figure out what the impacts of those programs are. So is it working? And if it doesn't work, what can you do to improve it? Those are all inputs that your Indian Education Committee gets to have on your school boards and your, and your educational programs. The additional powers are extremely important in regards to your Indian Education Committee. So when you form your Indian Educational Committee, you have organizational papers and the bylaws for your Indian Education Committees. If you include the additional powers and duties, you have a lot more powers than those I listed previously there. So looking at that, you get to, but you have, these have to be in the bylaws or you don't have them. So it's really important that your bylaws include these. The right to participate in negotiations concerning all contracts under your Johnson O'Malley funds. Make annual assessments of the learning needs of the Indian children in the community that's affected. And having access to all the reports, surveys, evaluations, budgets, anything that deals with the utilization of those funds. It's going to be subject to some Freedom of Information Act limitations, but if you're just asking for, if you're not asking for specific student information, you can get it all. If you're asking for broad information statistics. And again, one of the things you can do as an Indian education is request periodic reports and evaluations. So one of the things that Indian education committees could do is they could say, Every time we meet, we're going to have one or two students, I mean, not students or teachers come in and talk about the programs. So you can ask the teachers, what are you doing to incorporate Indian Education for All into your classroom? You can ask the students, how is that working? What's working? What's not working? Those are the periodic reports that you can request as an Indian Education Committee. One of the other things that Indian Education Committees can do is they can hear grievances. So we all know that Indian students tend to be disciplined at a higher rate than non-Indian students. The Indian Education Committee can get involved in that grievance process. And they can, they can have a part in determining the actions that are taken against the Indian students. So that, that is a huge piece of uh, uh, powers that the Indian Education Committee has that may help alleviate the disproportionate disciplinary actions against Indian students. You can also meet regularly with the staff and, uh, that serve the Indian students and do training with them. So that's another piece that can help uh, alleviate some of that bias that you see. Having those regular committee meetings is also important. 
they are open to the public, so I want you to make sure that those are always being um, advertised and made open. You can also do additional powers as long as they're consistent with these. So you can be creative if there's other things that you think are problems. As long as you put it in your bylaws and it doesn't go totally against something uh, due process wise, you're probably going to be allowed to do it. Education plans. This is what under uh, Johnson O'Malley the education plans are supposed to do. They're supposed to have those goals and the objectives for your community, for your educational needs of the students that are being served by Johnson O'Malley funds. Incorporating those programs and developing programs uh, that require those approval by your Indian Education Committee, that should be in your education plan. Changes in those programs, again, have to have the written approval of the Indian Education Committee. So if you've, if you've approved a plan, but they're going to make significant changes to that plan, that has to come back to the Indian Education Committee for approval. Due process provisions. Anytime you have an education plan, you have to be concerned about the due process piece of it. And when we talked about that grievance power, if the education committee wants to be involved in the grievance, there needs to be that due process structure. And the uh, grievance can be heard from the Indian students, the parents of the Indian students, community members, and tribal representatives. So those are uh, powers that the Indian education committee can exercise in that regards. Always have to give advance notice, adequate advance notice of any hearing on this. Being involved in that, that's a due process piece of it as well. Civil rights violations come under Title uh, 25 of the Code of Federal Register. This should be a given, but, but we have to reiterate it. They can't discriminate against the Indian students. So they've got to be treated the same as any other student. I would say that there may be an argument to be made that some of the disciplinary actions have some implicit bias in it that may be uh, disproportionate towards the Indian students. If there is a feeling that there is violations, discrimination violations, those must be reported to the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare. So that is a mandatory reporting piece. And once it's reported, the, uh, the department, the civil rights violation has to be investigated. And then there have to be appropriate steps taken to eliminate that discrimination and those practices that are discriminatory. So uh, impact aid changes, and this is where Jim Taylor is going to go more in depth on this, but impact aid changed by the Every Student Succeeds Act. There, there are those federal dollars that are allotted to schools within Indian country to offset those loss in uh, tax revenues from property tax due to that federal exempt lands to your tribal trust lands. It's going to be, it's being recorded and it'll be posted on YouTube. We have a uh, Facebook page for Montana Indian uh, Parents Committee that if you send an email to either Jim Taylor and I, we'll add you to that if you're not already part of that. So it'll be posted there. It'll be posted on the ACLU webpage. It'll be posted on the law school webpage. So we're distributing it fairly widely. Requirements under the impact aid that are going to be important for your Indian Education Committee are those consultation and involvement of parents and Indian tribes in the planning and development of the programs. A lot of tribes use their Indian Education Committees as part of that consultation. It doesn't have to be, but that is a natural fit. You've already got a committee that they can utilize for that consultation requirements. They have to be uh, given an opportunity to sort of voice what their concerns are, voice their views, indicate what activities they would like to see included, uh, make those recommendations th for programs and uh, I guess uh, services that are going to benefit their Indian kids within their community. Uh, Any time there is information that needs to, that would impact Indian kids, that needs to be disseminated to the parents and to the tribes as well. So funding areas, again, the impact aid goes for those payments 
uh, to offset the loss of property taxes. Those are base support payments under your impact aid. Uh, and the children with disability comes into that as well. So you may have what we would be viewed as like double dipping. You have Indian children with disabilities. They get to do it both for the Indian children and for the disabilities issue. Construction grants for building new facilities come under the impact aid as well. Uh, but again, all of this requires consultation. And those consultation is where Indian education committees can have a lot of influence. So there's an executive order that sort of starts off the whole consultation process. Uh, President Clinton issued an executive order that required consultation and coordination with Indian tribes when there was any federal dollars associated with the program. And as part of that, uh, it, it basically looks at what are the uh, rights that tribes have to be involved in that in developing those federal policies to utilize those dollars. And the term here that becomes important is establish regular and meaningful consultation. So looking at that meaningful consultation, that's the piece that you can usually challenge if all they're doing is saying approve this. Here's our program, approve it. That's not meaningful consultation. So the consultation requirements uh, come into play here. And every agency has to have a process for doing that meaningful consultation and getting timely input from tribal officials. And like I said, the tribal officials may allow that to come through the Indian Education Committees is where that consultation often comes in. These are the areas that they look at. Um, there can be negotiated rulemaking and looking at those Indian tribal treaty rights. As I indicated, a lot of the tribes, their treaties have educational pieces in it. So that's how the educational piece can come into play here too. In 2009, President Obama basically reaffirmed this consultation requirement. And he recognized that there's that unique legal and political relationships with your tribal governments. And as a result, there needs to be consultation. And again, the important language is that regular and meaningful consultation, but there's an addition here now, and collaboration with tribal officials. So now you not only have to consult, but it has to be done in collaboration. And so it's another step that goes into that process in developing educational programs. As part of that order from President Obama, he goes on and says why it is so important to have this consultation. And it's to create that sound and productive federal tribal relationship. So I want you to, to keep in mind that even though this responsibility has been delegated by the federal government to the states for education, it's still a federal responsibility. So the feds have an obligation to make sure that there is that consultation because it's federal dollars, it's federal responsibility. In looking at the new Every Child Succeed Act, there's some additional provisions looking at consultation. And in general, anytime you have a state plan, and those state plans are referring to are your state educational plans, the plan has to be developed. And again, they've added a new word here. So it's not only meaningful consultation, but timely consultation. So when we went around to the, some of the tribes did this training uh, over the last two years, one of the things that the tribal governments were telling us is the school districts would give them the budget that they have to sign off on the day before it was due. And that would be the first time that some of them had seen the budget. And they'd never been consulted about that budget. And, and so they were told, well, if you don't sign off, we're going to lose these dollars. And so the tribes were signing off. Well, that's not timely. So that timely and meaningful consultation means that you have to give the tribe sufficient time to review the budget and make comments on it and, and determine whether they have anything that they would like to modify or change in that budget. And that requires that consultation, again, with representatives of Indian tribes located in the state and parents. 
So it's not just the tribal government, the parents. So the way you get the parents involved is going to be through your Indian education committees. That's the easiest way to get parental involvement. Additional consultation requirements under the new act. Again, that timely and meaningful, so timely is the new phrase that they've included to meaningful consultation. So it's, a, so it's a, contacting the appropriate officials from the tribes or tribal organizations. So it can't just be that we contacted X, it's gotta be who the tribe says is the appropriate person to make contact with. And it's gotta be done in a manner and a time that provides that opportunity for appropriate uh, contributions by the tribe and by the parents. So meaningful substantial contributions is a phrase that they use and that requires that you have to have notice of it, you have to have an opportunity to respond. That's, that's a more definite, I don't think this is a huge change, this is what should have been happening, but because it wasn't happening, it seems to me what they've done under the new Every Child Succeeds Act is they've been more detailed as to what that's going to require for consultation. The other piece that comes into play here is they require that documentation now. So it's a written affirmation signed by the appropriate officials that they um, have had that opportunity to consult on the required uh, program there. So now it's that they have to sign off on that. Uh, now there is that little phrase after, uh, if the tribe doesn't, that doesn't mean you're blocked and you can't go forward. You can still submit the documentation and indicate that you had given them an opportunity and they chose not to. So the local education agency, the, um, the new statute defines that. So if the local education agency has an enrollment of American Indian or Alaska Native students that's not less than 50%. So if you have more than 50% enrolled, you're going to be viewed as an Indian entity there. And then that goes through the uh, parts as to that funding piece that Jim Taylor is going to go more in. So I just want to let you know that there's definitions that were not there. Appropriate officials is the other term that's now defined. And it's the tribal elected officials, or again, it's appointed people that are designated in writing by the tribe as being able to perform that consultation purpose. So the tribe could say, we want the Indian education committees to do this. And if they do that in writing, then the Indian education committees are going to be the ones that fulfill that consultation purposes for the tribes. The, there's rules of construction here, and uh, one of the things that the new rules say is the local education agency uh, is not going to be the one that's required to determine the appropriate officials. The tribe has to do that, not the local officials. And they're not going to be liable for consultation with the appropriate officials. Uh, and there's no liability that's going to be uh, imposed on them. Uh, if they don't identify the appropriate officials. Again, if there's supposed to be consultation and it doesn't happen, it's not going to interfere with that timely submission of the plans. I, however, I would say if the timely uh, submission of the plan is problematic simply because they did not give the tribes adequate time to review it, then I think that is going to be can be used to say that it's not through any fault of the tribe, it's because the local uh, education agency did not meet its obligations under the code. Family engagement in law schools, or law schools, the Indian schools, <laughs> you can tell where I work, huh? Um, the, the interior uh, in, it has to do this in consultation with the Secretary of Education. So as we know, for a lot of tribal things, it's not just under one agency. We have a lot of different agencies that impact funding in Indian country. So Department of Interior does a huge amount, but you have education as well and you have health. So you have other departments uh, under the Secretary that have to come into play. They have to establish how to enter into those contracts and cooperative agreements with your local tribes and organizations. 
Uh, Indian can have Indian tribes or Indian communities can have nonprofit parental organizations that can also be involved in this process under the statute. And one of the things that's come up at previous actions is FERPA, uh, that, that uh, Indian education committees were being told that they could not access information because of FERPA. And I just want to give you a very broad overview of what the Family Education Rights and Privacy Act does. So as a general rule, FERPA does prohibit the disclosure of personally identifiable information derived from educational records. So that you can't get the grades of the students. You can't get, um, potentially you can't get addresses if they've said they didn't want that disclosed. So you can't get something that would be identifiable to a specific student under FERPA. But if it's being obtained through personal knowledge, not through the school, you can access that. So that's not going to be protected. And we know about Facebook in Indian country. Most things are going to show up on Facebook. So you're probably going to get information that has nothing to do with the school district. It's coming from some other source. Um, and that's going to be true even if there is an educational record that says that, if you got it from some source other than the school. If you're disclosing, uh, if you're asking the school to disclose personally identifiable information, uh, you can't do that if the, um, uh, if the parent or the guardian has said you can't have that. So I know for one of the Indian Education Committees, they were trying to get addresses of the Indian students so they could invite them to an event, and the school said, we can't give you that information. Well, they can give you that information unless you have a parent that says, I don't want that disclosed. So, so that's, that's where the, um, there may be some resistance from school districts to give you information like that. But unless the parent has said, I don't want this, or a guardian has said, I don't want this information disclosed, you can access those records in order to meet those obligations of the Indian Parent Committee. Um, so. Um, that, that's what the second one here, the identifiable, personally identifiable information from the records, uh, they are permitted to disclose that without consent uh, if, if that box has not been checked. So who's a school official? Because that's who you can disclose this information to. And that is going to include your teachers and it also has the ability to have information disclosed if the school determines that the person making the request has a legitimate educational interest in the information. And this is where it sort of gets tricky because there is an argument to be made that your Indian education committees have a legitimate educational interest in the Indian students. And so you have to sort of go through that analysis and determine it. Is this defined? Well, no, of course not. That would be too easy. But that has included, when they've looked at that, the, the, the people that have been included in that are going to be your teachers. It's going to be your administrators of your school. It's going to be board members, so your school board. It can be support staff and clerical staff. It can be the attorney for the school, nurses and health staff, counselors, human resource staff, informational specialist, school security personnel, and this is the last one, and contract, consultant, volunteer, or other parties to whom the school has outsourced institutional services or functions. Well, that can be your Indian Education Committee because you have a function in that school by federal statute. If it's non-consensual, uh, personal, identifiable, the, the, um, all, this can only be disclosed to certain individuals. And those are mainly going to be your federal agencies that require that data for purposes of determining the programs. So it's a very limited here for those audit purposes. It can also be for organizations conducting studies for or on behalf of the school 
Uh, so if that's where I'm saying, if you want statistical information, you don't want it personally identifiable to any one individual student, you can make that request. So you can say to the school, I want to know how many Indian students are not passing this class or how many Indian students are absent more than so many days. You're asking for numbers, you're not asking for specifically identifiable information to any one student. You can make those requests because it's part of how you're going to determine what the needs of those Indian children are and what kind of support the Indian Education Committee can provide. So that determining whether there's that legitimate educational interest, that's something when you're making the request, you need to identify what your educational interest is in this material that would help you get that information you're seeking. And I guess that's it for me. Questions? Uh, Maylin, can you talk about the, uh, how the Johnson O'Malley Committee, Indian Education Committees are selected and who's on So, so yeah, the Johnson O'Malley Committees are usually going to be done within your school districts and that, those are every school district if they have the, uh, an Indian population that, and it's not an Indian school board, you're going to have to have one. So that, has, that information has to go out to every parent of an Indian children, of an Indian child within that district to be given an opportunity to participate in that committee. So the bylaws that are for your Indian Education Committee are going to tell you how they're selected. That's why your bylaws are so important. But that is the process of going through um, every year, going through and determining who's going to be on your Indian Education Committee. So bylaws are incredibly important for your Indian Education Committees. Mm -hmm. So this sounds wonderful. Yeah. Um, the things like, you know, the um, timely information, participation, all the evaluation stuff, the ability to actually have an impact on your school sounds great. Yep. But, I'm hearing a but here. <laughs> Not knowing how to do that. Right. Because uh, it just, there seems like a, in, in our school district, a lack of dis there's a disconnect between right. your IC committee and your admin and staff. And how do you create that relationship and not, so it's not a threat, but yeah. you're actually helping your whole school, not just the Indian kids, but That's right. the whole school. And so how is that even enforced? Well, so, so the, the, and this is maybe where I have Jim Taylor come up because uh, the, the, there are remedies if they're not doing it. If you've made a request to comply with this and they're not, then that is their violations there. Um, and, and you can talk about some of the things you've done in that. Yeah, well, there, there are a couple of things that you can do. We, we have a, a group now of about 50 Indian parents from all around the state. And one thing you can do is send out a request to ask other committees around the state what they've done and things that have worked for them. But if, if, you, if you aren't able to resolve that through that, um, you can contact the ACLU. We now have a racial justice project we'll talk about in a little bit. And this is one of the issues that we've identified is education as a civil right. So if you're dealing with a school that's not giving you information in a timely matter, you've gone through all your processes, nothing seems to be working, Give us a call. So I will tell you it's very effective when you have a lot of that comes either from the ACLU or even the Indian Law Ooh. Clinic that says, this request has been made. This complies with the XXX of the federal code. You've not done it. You have X amount of days to do it or we will be seeking further remedies. They generally get the information then. We usually get a pretty good response. Yeah. It's unfortunate. I like to build relationships, but it seems like sometimes it has to come to that. Well, if unfor you're, unfortunately, it may have to start out that. You can then build those relationships once you start getting that working relationships. But I think a lot of school districts think they don't have to do any of this. And that's been a problem. And it's, that's why I think it's really important that Indian Education Committees, in particular, know what powers they have. Because that's, that's where Johnson O'Malley is so important. It's not for the funding dollars that you get from Johnson O'Malley. Impact aid is far greater in the school budget than the Johnson O'Malley funds. But it's those powers that come with Johnson O'Malley that are so important for your Indian parents. Do the school administrators get training like this? To um, they have been offered this training. Sometimes they show up and sometimes they don't. And if they don't, then 
is there a possibility to get it on PIR day for them? We have done We've that. We've done it on PIR we've day. We've done it on PIR day. But uh, one of the reasons we're doing this training today is because it's being filmed and we're going to make it available broadly so that although we've been to all the reservations, you know, there are so many communities and there's people are not able to come right. to always come to the trainings, you know. There are a lot of schools on every reservation. So we wanted a, an electronic version that we could use to to uh, spread the word. So we could share this with our school board? Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. And yeah. we've actually offered to do this training to the school board we, we association, did. but we actually never heard back from Right. So you can, you know, if, particularly on Flathead, because you guys are fairly close to us, if any of the school boards wanted this training, something specific, I would be more than happy to come. They need it. Yeah. Well, so, but, okay, so you think they need it. As an Indian Parent Committee, that's a power that you can say. This is what we want. That's a programmatic thing. We want them to have education on this. You can make that as a programmatic plan, as part of the plan that you're supposed to be consulted on. That's something you can say we want in there. You, you could say we want our school board to have a training on what consultation means. We want them to have a training on how they have to interact with the Indian Education Committees. So I did a training with the, I can't remember the title, but it's the Indian school boards. Um, this was a couple years ago. And one of the people, one of the school board members, and I don't even remember which, <laughs> where the person was, said, uh, every meeting we have a teacher come and explain to us how they're incorporating Indian education for all into their curriculum. Well, if you know that the school board is gonna be asking you to do that, you're gonna be doing that then. You're not just gonna be saying, yeah, I don't have to do that. I think the same can happen with your Indian Education Committee, as you can say. We want to hear from the school board. We want to hear from the administration. We want to hear from the teachers what they're doing to ensure their materials are culturally appropriate, they have cultural sensitivity, and how they're incorporating Indian Education for All. And you rotate it through. And you can also have somebody from your committee go to every school board meeting. Yep. Now, I know that that's, not, that's a lot of time, but all these things are a lot of time. And uh, you can be there reminding them every time they meet. You could be a regular agenda item on every yeah. school board meeting. <laughs> every meeting. Every meeting. And we are, but I'm just, it's more like a report. Tell us what you're doing. No, but they need to be telling you what they're doing. That's the yeah, difference. Yeah. Kind of what I've been doing is getting up and saying, oh, we're doing this, that, and that, and this, and we're looking forward to meeting you guys. But, you know, but the next meeting. are there is that the board. So the next meeting, you say, yeah, here's what we're doing, and we want to know when we're going to be scheduling our next consultation for your plan. So if your school boards are not taking you seriously, I think you need to probably be a little more assertive and that you want that consultation. And you can cite them to the federal statute. Because that, that's the funding piece comes from that consultation. And this is where the tribes, the tribal education departments in particular, if you have a tribal education department, can really be involved in that is the tribes need to be saying, we're not going to be signing off on these plans unless you're doing consultation. And that consultation may be with the education department, and it can be, they can say, and we want you to be doing it with your Indian education committees. So getting the tribes to also require that and say, we're not going to sign off on your impact aid unless you do that is, we'll get their attention, I assure you. Mm -hmm. so, 
tribes should not sign off on impact aid unless they've been consulted with in an agreement. And you only have to say once, I'm not signing off on impact aid for the, for the school to get their attention, I think. Because it's a huge part of their budget. And we'll talk about impact aid in a little bit, but just one thing to note, if your school takes impact aid money and dumps it into oh, yeah. the general fund, that means you're entitled to be consulted on everything. Everything. Mm -hmm. Any program that's affected by that funding, you're entitled to be consulted for. And if it goes into the general fund, mm -hmm. that means everything. And most of them do put it in the general fund. After this, they may not. Well, you can bet impact aid is going to teach your salaries already because it's a huge portion. But yes, absolutely. So you need to have parent committee members on the evaluation. Right. That can be part of the that, discussion. That can be part. But even if it's not, they have a right to do the, the teacher evaluations under Johnson O'Malley. That's already recognized as part of that evaluation because those teachers are teaching Indian kids. 